Welcome back, class. We're getting ready to jump into segment four, and we're going to talk about indifference curves. And, and again, the text talks about this. This is, for a lot of students, it is a difficult chapter. Uh, it's even difficult chapter for professors to explain. And a lot of the concepts in this chapter, I have to, have to, have to stop and think about it. Uh, I have to stop and think about, okay, what happens to that ratio? Um, then it doesn't hurt, you know, stop, collect your thoughts, especially if you're on a test, you know, collect your thoughts and say, okay, what, what, what happens to that ratio? How, how does that ratio change? My denominator gets larger, my numerator gets smaller. And um, as long as we're just talking about what happens in the denominator, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Where it gets complicated is uh, when you're, you're, you're talking about economics and you're looking at ratios and how they change um it it it's the magnitude of the change between the numerator and the denominator that's that's where it kind of gets complicated especially uh for most of us and that's where we really have to stop and think about it but so far we're just talking about changes in the denominator so if you can distill it down to that it's it's fairly straightforward <clears throat> so the authors jump into indifference curves and they start talking about the budget constraint that we've you know talked about previously and they're going to set the model up again being good economists they set it up as you know bundles of two goods and services of course your budget constraints you've got bundles of multiple goods and services but in a two good and service world you just you have to make sure that um you're when you're talking about your budget constraint the price of X times the quantity of X plus the price of Y times the quantity of Y is less than or equal to your budget. That's all, you know, in a too good world, that's all you got to worry about. Uh, fairly straightforward. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's the way economists like it. We, we like things simple. We, you know, we like things simple. And then if we can get it to work for a simple model, then you can start taking and expanding it to more goods and services. And, you know, hopefully your model still works when it gets to that point. Uh, and so they they talk about <clears throat> in the in the text they they talk about um, a budget line, and so you know graphically shows the maximum combination of two goods that a consumer can buy with a given budget. And you you know you're talking about uh, on a budget line. Uh, talking about, you know, the impacts, you know, you think about the impacts of inflation and the price changes and the real wealth and, you know, purchasing power. I mean, that's what you hear um, when you're, when you're listening to the talking heads on Fox or CNN or, or, you know, I don't know, whatever news channel you listen to. And, you know, the budget line's going to, you know, it can change and it can change slope. And, you know, you can have different, you know, intercepts on the X and Y axis, depending on the impacts of, of, of all of these basically macroeconomic uh, influences. But in our simple model, we've got, you know, we've got it set. We've got the budget line set. And so it's, you know, the budget line between goods and services, X and Y, and it's um, combinations. So if you think about the budget line, downward sloping, almost looks like a, you know, demand curve, but it's downward sloping and uh, it intersects the y-axis and the x-axis at, at, you know, two different points. And uh, basically what they're saying is that here's your budget line. If you're talking about points out here above and to the right of the budget line, they're unattainable. You don't have the budget to get to it. If you're talking about uh, points below the budget line, so between the budget line and the, and the origin, of, of your right triangle, the, you know, the right angle, those, if it's a point there, it means you're spending less than your budget. So uh, to maximize utility, remember, we're, we're making the assumption in this utility maximization exercise that uh, you, you don't save, you can't spend more than your budget, so you can't reach this point above and to the right, and you're not saving, so you're going to spend your entire budget. So you, you want to maximize your utility. You're going to be somewhere on that budget line. Uh, and remember, uh, on the budget line, uh, it's, you know, they're, they're talking about the slope. And again, it's rise over run. And it's the, uh, when they're talking about the budget line, 
where it can get sometimes confusing to students, they're talking about the negative of, 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 of the budget divided by the price of Y over the budget divided by the twice of, of price of X. So again, they're talking about the change in Y, the change in X. They're just looking at it a little differently. Uh, and through math magic, and again, you can, you know, if, if you, you know, we talk about, or I talk about the math magic different places in these chapters, but rearranging terms and playing around the terms, you can actually get the slope of the budget line to be the negative of the price of X divided by the price of Y. So that is the slope of your budget line. So it, 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 they, you know, the text goes through some gyrations. Uh, and again, it's math magic, and I can't even remember whether they show you all the steps or not, but uh, it goes back to simple, you know, I don't want to say simple algebra, but, but goes back to your algebra equations and, you know, substitution and multiplication and breaking things apart. But at some point, that's what you end up with, and it's the negative of the price of X over the price of Y, and that actually implies it's the opportunity cost and the market trade-offs between the two goods, and that's what that ultimate formula of the budget line or the slope of the budget line looks like and that's what it's trying to tell us and if you think about the the consumption <clears throat> uh or the assumptions of consumer choice it's it's the rankability so you've got preferences between any you know two bundles and you, it and it goes back to places like um Okay, I had to go shopping today. So I went to Costco shopping, had to pick up some things. Uh, and while I was there, I decided, you know, I'm going to eat. And, you know, they've got a fairly decent little food court. The food's, the food's not bad and it's, you know, priced right, certainly. And so I go to the, you know, I go to, and they, they have your order. You got the little computer screens and you're standing there ordering and I'm looking at it. And, you know, I can get for a dollar for a buck 50, I can get a hot dog and a Coke. Uh, or for dollar ninety nine and sixty nine cents, I think I can get a slice of pizza and a coke. Uh, and so I'm trying to manage. I'm trying to manage my my budget constraint. I'm looking at at multiple uh, different combinations at that point. So I finally ended up. You know, I decide. Well, I'm going to get uh, a hot dog and a soda for a buck fifty, and I can tack on. For, I can get a you know, an ice cream sundae for, I think it's two forty nine dollars or something. And I opt for that. A little more expensive than uh, what I had for my, uh, my my pizza and a Coke. But to me, it's a whole lot more, it goes back to your total utility. I get a whole lot more total utility out of that combination than I did for the pizza. And, and it, you know, and it, and it gets me below. I had, I didn't want to spend, I, I kind of set it at $5 when I go in there. And so it, it keeps me below my budget constraint of $5. That's all I want to spend at Costco. And I, I managed to get my total utility as high as my maximize my total utility based on my, my budget constraint. So I'm implicitly ranking my utility based on, you know, combinations of things that I can get at Costco. Uh, you may have done the same thing this morning. If you went to Starbucks for breakfast, you had you know, you coffee, you know, different styles of coffee, different prices. You've got tea. Uh, they've got some, I don't know, some muffins and some cake and sandwiches and things at Starbucks. And, you know, you've got a certain budget constraint. You're ranking all the combinations and you come out of there with, at least in your mind, at least in your perception, maximizing your total utility given a certain budget constraint. And, then when they're talking about rankability, they start talking about indifference curves. And an indifference curve is a graph that shows combinations of two goods that yield equal levels of utility. I think in the text, they talk about skiing and horseback riding, maybe. Uh, but it can be any two goods or services yielding a certain level of utility. And the points above and below give more or less utility. So, and one point that they probably should point out in the text up front is individuals can have, you can have hundreds of utility of indifference curves, hundreds of indifference curves with different levels of utility. So, you know, that's, that's where you're, where you're looking at, you know, indifference curves, 
different levels of utility. You may have a total level utility of 50 on one, 75 and 150 on another. But you've got all of these multiple utility and difference curves with different levels of utility, but you only got one budget constraint. And that's where you that's where you start playing around with it to get to, to the maximization of utility. Total utility is subject to your budget constraint. And one of the other assumptions of consumer choice, and we've talked about it on multiple occasions, is more is preferred less. It's human desires. Ever, you know, human nature more is, you know, preferred to less. And finally, in this consumer choice, they bring in this concept of um, trans, you know, transitivity. So, you, got, you know, go back to your, to your, I guess, basic algebra. And, you know, you had the transitive process and you said, if, if A is preferred to B, and B is preferred to C, then A must be preferred to C. That's a transitive property that, I don't know, you learned what, junior high, maybe maybe you didn't get into it and you got into high school, but, and that um, and that is what's important when you're talking about these indifference curves, because again, you've got indifference curves below and indifference curves above uh, your budget line or your budget constraint. Consumers have, and again, consumers have multiple indifference curves and total utility. Consumers have an indifference map. And when they talk about the indifference map, it, you know, it's basically all of these, all these indifference curves mapped out for you at different levels of utility. Now, when you go into the grocery store, you don't, you know, you don't have in your mind's eye this, you know, indifference curve map and all these utility, you know, indifference curves maps out. But you subconsciously have a pretty good idea of what your total utility is going to be when you get to the checkout counter and what your budget constraint is going to be. So if, you know, and, and I, I didn't see it today in Costco, but uh, I guess the last time we have Publix and Kroger's here in Atlanta, so last time I went to Publix, the you see, especially senior citizens, you see them walking around Publix with their calculators out. And they are they are buying items, putting them in the grocery cart, and they're and they're counting it on the calculator. They'll and you and I'll see them. They'll buy an item. They'll put it in a grocery cart. They'll calculate it. Then they'll shake head and they take and put put one item back and select another one at a different price and put it in. And they're satisfied and they go on to the next thing. And I think part of that rationale is is a lot of these Medicare Advantage plans, and especially if you're on. Um, you know, if, if you're like dual eligibles where you've got, you know, you've got, you've got social security and you've got, you know, you've got some, some, you've got some subsidies from Medicaid, uh, unemployment benefits, something, you've got these EBT cards and the EBT cards, these electronic benefit transfer cards that you'll see people using the grocery store. They, they are X number of dollars are transferred on a monthly basis to that card that they can use to buy, uh, I think it's supposed to be healthy, uh, healthy food items. I don't know, you know, what the definition of healthy is, but I think they can, you know, use it to to purchase. You can't, you can't, you know, buy alcohol. You can't, you know, I'm sure there's other, you know, things that you can't buy. But they they know how much is on this card, and they are calculating as they go through the grocery store. So that's their budget constraint. That's their budget constraint for. Let's say they go to the grocery store once a week and they take in whatever that EBT card, whatever that total is, they chunk it into four chunks and that becomes their budget line or their budget constraint for that grocery store visit. So you see them, you see them kind of going through that process. And so you've got this utility, uh, this, you know, indifference curve map and it's got all these indifference curves on it. And the basic properties of an indifference curve, and they go through them in the textbook, uh, the, the, the slope is downward. More of one means less of another. You know, it's basic, you know, looking at opportunity cost drives that, you know, downward slope. They don't cross each other because it validates the more is preferred to less assumption. So you're not going to see them crossing each other. And they're convex to the origin. So it means they bow out 
you know, they they bow in, so it's it's like a it's like an umbrella facing out from the origin, uh, and it's because the trade-offs without uh, impacting utilities, what causes them to be bowed out from the origin, and that's where they get into the marginal rate of substitution. That they that's at this point that's where they uh, introduce the marginal rate of substitution, and it basically says a maximum of out of one good a consumer is would be willing to give up in order to obtain an additional unit of another good. And as long as there's a marginal rate of substitution diminishes, the curve will be bowed out from the origin. And the marginal rate of substitution of X and Y is the marginal uh, utility of X divided by the marginal utility of Y. So basically, you know, how many units of one are you willing to give up to obtain another unit of, of so you know you're you're reallocating units of x and y, and that's why you have this marginal rate of substitution uh, between these two goods of services. And at that point, um, I think I'm going to stop at that point and give you a chance to absorb some of this. And then we're going to come back and we're going to hopefully pull all this together and try to put this piece to bed with this one last segment. Talk to you in a few minutes.